we're going to be talking about the world music from East Asia. So that includes China, Mongolia, Korea, both North and South Korea, Japan, and Tibet. As always, folks, you can find this presentation on our Google Classroom in the form of slides if you wish to go through it at your own, um, at your own pace. All right, let's begin. So today we're going to be looking at nine different sites throughout the entirety of the East Asia region. Um, we have Mongolia, China, Tibet on the western side here in Nepal. Uh, just sorry, it's just just north of Nepal. We have uh, Korea here. We also have Japan, uh, and yeah, that's it. All right, let's begin. So a little bit of background information. In this part of world, the world, in East Asia, there's approximately 4.5 billion people, which is about one quarter of the world's population right now. There is a heavy, heavy influence uh, from China. As you know, in this area, China is the largest landmass, the largest country in East Asia. And so naturally, there would be a lot of Chinese influence in the countries that are part of the East Asian um, area. There are many dynastic histories. Um, Chinese history is conceived in terms of dynasties. So with one ruler ruling for a period of time, we call that a dynasty. And those dynasties can last from one year all the way through to 50 years and more. Um, in China, okay, it, it's a ruling family. We like the Ming dynasty. And the, the name of the era is characterized by the family name and their dominance in that region. Um, traditions today have met um, a lot of the old style traditions in East Asia. Um, as we will see, a lot of traditions have evolved into modern day times, but some um, true traditions have still held in this part of the world. Just like in food, there are similarities and differences between the cultures and everyday life of the countries that make up East Asia, right? If we look at food in um, the north, in Mongolia, the predominant food choice is um, uh, meat background and root vegetables, whereas you get differences in China as well as in Korea in the terms of food, whereas in China, the predominant food is more so um, uh, noodles, rice noodles. Um, in the northern parts of China, you get a lot of people eating just rice uh, in the more um, rural parts of China. And that goes with Korea and Japan as well. There are different regions of those countries where the food choices, just like the music choices, are culturally influenced, depending on where you are in the country. So our first uh, country today in East Asia is China. There are four different sites in China. The Gu Qin, which is um, um, an ancient instrument, uh, an ancient zither. The Jiangnan Shi Su, which is the silk and bamboo style of music at the, as our second site. The third site is the Jingzhu from Beijing or Peking. Um, this is the Beijing style opera. And then we also get the Yangbang Shi, which is the revolutionary Beijing opera, um, branched off of the Jingzhu. So to begin, we arrive in China. China has the world's uh, largest population of about 1.4 billion people. In this part of the world, in East Asia, as well as predominantly in China, they have their writing system is ideographic, where they use icon-like characters that have different meanings. Um, and as you can see here, there's characters here that mean different things. Um, whereas we have words, one word equals one thing, whereas these characters actually mean up, uh, mean different, uh, a bunch of different words in one um, symbol, in one uh, uh, character. Uh, philosophy is really big in China. Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism are the main forms of religion, as well as the philosophies that people believe in in China. Um, we also get a, a very prominent Confucian um, philosopher, Kong Fu Zi. He is very highly influenced and influenced the role of music in daily life, that music should be part of daily life. 
as we know, communism is still prevalent in China. Um, and it began under Chairman Mao Zedong. Uh, who believed that music and theater could influence people, and he harnessed the power of the arts to create a correct way of thinking in terms of politics in the people of China itself. Because the arts are very structured, the structure, the political structure of the communist of communist China, is very similar to the structure, the very rigid structure of music and the arts. And. Um, Chairman Mao used music as a tool of propaganda, propaganda uh, which is not the case today. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Our first site is the Gukin, or the Guqin. This is an ancient zither. Okay? And remember, a zither is an instrument that is uh, either plucked or struck, where you have these strings going across um, a, a bridge... And the entire instrument itself is the resonating chamber. There's no actual chamber here, but it, the entire instrument itself is the resonating chamber. Now, Chinese music is fundamentally vocal. Okay, There's a lot of singing and original uh, regional folk songs that go along here. Now, what you're going to do is you should pause the video here, head to our Google Classroom. You will see all nine different songs, and they are labeled... Um, specifically to the titles of our slides. Um, so right now, pause the video, have a listen to the Gukin, which is the ancient zither, and we'll, we'll chat about it in a second. All right, so what did you think of the song? It's, it's quite interesting. The sounds are really interesting. Um, for me, my first impressions of the Gukin, okay, remember, it's a bridgeless, so there's no bridge, plucked zither, it has seven strings, and it's very quiet and very intimate and very soft in terms of the sound that it produces. In terms of our oral analysis, what we hear, okay, um, there's lots of harmonics and there's these tone slidings. As you can see, as, the, um, as you can hear, you get these tone slides, these bending of pitches, very similar to what happens when you pluck a string on a guitar and you move your fingers along the fretboard. It changes the tone. It it, you slide along the fretboard to change the harmonics and the tone of the string. It is played in free rhythm, so there's no set tempo, no set beat, but it's played in free rhythm, which means um, that the musician is able to play uh, at, a, at any tempo they'd like and changing tempo within. Now, in China, most traditional music struggles to survive as best it can. As we will see um, in other countries of East Asia, China, China's sound and China's music that is related to China actually has evolved over time. And the traditional music that we will see in other countries like Japan and Korea um, really never took hold. And, and even to today, you don't find a lot of traditional Chinese music. You find a lot of Western influences in the Chinese art form. Cultural considerations of the Gukin and this style of music. Okay. Um, the Gukin is considered a scholar's instrument. It is studied uh, for its express expression and the ethical values of Confucianism. So there's a lot of connection between the instrument of the Gukin and the, the values of, uh, of the people of China. There's um, this form of sonic meditation, oral sonic meditation. By listening to music, it relaxes you. There's lots of themes to this um, type of music, um, and they usually come in the form of these, these four different themes. Nature, literature or mythology, the mood, so the way we feel, and the musical structure. So there's these old style traditional beats that have remained, but for the most part, the style of music, the old traditions of Chinese music has evolved. There's not a lot, not a lot of traditional music still played. A lot of it has been influenced by the West, by, by European classical music. Our second site is the Changdan Shisu, which is also called the Silk and Bamboo Ensemble. The Shisu is a type of instrument, um, uh, a type of, sorry, the Shisu. Uh, Jiangnan, it just simply means ensemble. The Shisu is silk and bamboo, 
Okay, and, and this type of ensemble is consp comprised of Chinese stringed instruments, silk instruments, okay, and flutes, where we get the bamboo in, in the name of this ensemble. Now, don't forget, pause the video here and have a listen to the Zhangnan Sizu. All right, welcome back. My first impressions on this song are that there is a very clear melodic line and it gives this flowing sense when we listen to it. The oral analysis, so what I'm hearing, is the Bai Yin organological system. Okay, As you can see in the photo here, there's different types of instruments, all using different um, uh, uh, materials, the Bai Yin. So we have stone uh, materials using stones, uh, metal, gourds, right? Uh, big, big drum type things. Um, skin instruments in drums, wood, clay, and silk and bamboo instruments. We get a heterophonic structure in the music. So there's different, um, everybody's playing at the same time. So different sounds are being played at the same time. It's There's no solos. And there's an exceptionally clear tempo, a clear beat in this type of ensemble music. So the types of instruments that you're going to find, um, like I said, are the eru, okay, which is here. Okay, the Eru is a Chinese fiddle with a round wooden resonator at the bottom. That wooden resonator is covered in python, so the, the snake skin, python skin, to, to resonate. Um, and there are also two silk strings that run the length of the instrument. Okay, as you can see here, there's two silk strings based on the number of knobs. And it is the sound is generated using a bow. On the right here, we have the yang kin, which is very similar to the gu kin. Okay, it has five to six rows of bridges. So as you can see, there's many, many different rows of strings here, all overlapping one another. Each string is actually a course of two or three strings lined together. And the player strikes the strings with two small bamboo beaters or hammers often used as an accompaniment instrument, very similar to the piano in Western music today. We also get the pipa, which is a, a large form of the lute. Okay, and the pipa is, extens is an extensive solo instrument. It has a hollow wooden pear-shaped body with four strings that pass over raised bamboo frets, as you can see here that allow for chromatic playing, just like our, our guitar. Frets allow for the chromatic, the in-between notes to be played. And players use all five fingernails, okay, to pluck the strings. And sometimes players will put on their, on their fingers um, different plucking instruments to help them so they don't actually have to use their fingernails. And lastly, we get the uh, ditsi, which is our bamboo instrument. It is very similar to a flute, except for at one end, <coughs> um, either this, uh, I believe it's actually the, um, the left end with the blowing hole. So over here, we get a membrane hole. And this membrane is actually covered with a type of sheepskin or snakeskin, python skin, that resonates and air flows through here very similar to a flute. All right, so some cultural considerations of the Shisu, the Changnan Shisu, the uh, silk and bamboo ensemble style of music, okay, is that there's different region, regional styles of this of the Shisu type ensemble. So depending on where you are in China, you're gonna have ensembles that provide different types of instrumentation and different types of sound. Okay, and we, we consider this to be very amateur music. It is described as amateur music because it is played generally by non-professional musicians in a very casual clubhouse setting um, or even in a home setting uh, for people's own pleasure. So people, a lot of the time, shih tzu ensembles um, would be played as people enjoy their coffee or play board games um, or mahjong. Um, and it's just a background type filler uh, sound where people can come together and just play music from all over wa all walks of life. All right, so now we move into our third site. This is the Jingzhu Beijing Opera. Pause the video here, have a listen to the opera itself. All right, so first impressions. Well, what I hear is there's a lot of shrill voices, 
and there's this nasally fiddle sound. It's not the greatest type of sound. We get a lot of these rising and falling in the gongs. So the gongs are hit at different um, at different strengths to give this rise and fall as well. There's different sized gongs to give us different pitches. Jingzhu means capital city opera. So Jingzhu in Chinese, in actually um, the Cantonese language, means the capital city opera. It's a melodic ensemble that is playing as the opera performers are performing as well. All ro roles are sung with almost no vibrato in the voice, so it's very, uh, very straightforward. And there are many voices that sound very nasally. The sound is resonating in the nose chamber and it's very high in range. There's lots of movement in the percussion section, lots of very fast paced movements in the percussion section. And there are no females on the stage. It's all, <coughs> excuse me, males playing the female roles. They are female impersonators. The cultural considerations of the this type of opera, the Jingzhu opera, um, is that it, there's lots of symbolic scenery in these scenes. Okay, it's very stylized and there's major role types that are played. Now you do see some females in this type of opera today, but in the past, the original, the traditional Jingzhu opera does not have any actual true female actors. The major roles are the Zheng, which is played by a male, the Dan, which is female, the Jing, which is the painted face character, and the Chu, the comedians. And here's just a scene of um, the Jingzhu opera style of the musicians. Remember, the musicians sometimes will be uh, in the back of the stage and the uh, the the um, performers will be in the front, or the Jingzhu um, musical performers will be off to the side. And we come to our last site uh, in China. This is the Yangbang Shi, okay, the revolutionary Beijing opera. Now, pause the video here, have a listen. All right, so first impressions. Well, we get this very orchestral sound. Right? There's a lot of Western traditions here. There's a lot of Western harmonies and Western musicians like a violin, the flute, brass and horned instruments that we hear in this. This is not your traditional um, Jingzhu opera. This is the revolutionary Beijing opera, the Yangbang Shi, where the influence is highly influenced from the West. And remember I said that traditional Chinese music hasn't really stuck hold today. There's a lot of evolution that has happened in the music, and those traditional sounds are, are not really found any longer. Some cultural condition, considerations. So this style of, of opera and this style of music came out of the Cultural Revolution in, from 1966 to 1976, where people were subjected to non-stop propaganda from Chairman Mao Zedong. This propaganda was all about the ideas, the philosophical ideas in terms of uh, communism and everybody working together to, to be, become strong. Okay, And we get a lot of different um, types of music coming out of this. We get revolutionary ballets. We get revolutionary symphonies and operas that showcase this you know, um, communistic ideas from the chairman. But the influence that the West, Europe, had the, in terms of music, had on this style of music, the bang, uh, the, um, the Zhang Bang Xi uh, style of opera, okay, is very, very um, prevalent. We can hear the different types of music being played. All right, let's go to our second country, which is Mongolia. And we have one site to visit, which is the throat singing and overtone singing of the musicians from Mongolia. This is just north of China, still within East Asia. So in Mongolia itself, we have lots of nomadic herders, people who live off of the land, uh, who live in yurts, these uh, tent-like structures. We also get our um, very famous uh, historical figures, such as Genghis or Chungus Khan and his son Kublai Khan and there's a lot of Soviet influences because you have to remember that Mongolia is squished between Russia and or the former Soviet Union which we know as Russia 
and China. It's squished right in between there. And so there's lots of influences from both China and the former Soviet Union or Russia in Mongolia itself. The throat singers of Mongolia. So there are a couple of very famous throat singers. Um, but as you can see, take a pa pause the video here. Have a listen to the throat singing. It's just song number five in our Google Classroom. All right, welcome back. So in the throat singing, we get the first impressions that I get. We get this whistling low grumble. This I I cannot do it justice, but we get this kind of whistling low grumble in the background. Upon listening to it, we get there's a lot of overtones. So you get um, some lower and some higher notes that are an octave apart. We get a fundamental drone that's played in the background. So there's this underlying that's played in the background. And we get this instrument called the Murenchur. Murenchur, okay, is a two-stringed instrument. It's a fiddle. Um, it has two strings and a bow. There's a resonating chamber, but we call this a horse-headed fiddle, fiddle because at the very end of our fiddle here, of the Murenhur, okay, we get a horse, a horse shape, a horse decorative um, uh, uh, head to this um, type of instrument. So some cultural considerations. There's a lot of spiritual connection in this type of music. In the Republic of Tuva, which is an area of Mongolia, okay, this type of music is predominantly performed in yurts, these round tents that people live in. There's a lot of um, very, uh, uh, there's a lot of Western attraction to this type of music because it is very unique. Now, in terms of Canadian music, we get a lot of throat singers in uh, Nunavut and the Yukon, as well as in the Northwest Territories, that have a very similar sound to the Mongolian throat singers. It's, it's very interesting to, to note. So if you have a chance, Google or YouTube um, Mongolian throat singers or even Canadian uh, Inuit throat singers and compare them to the throat singers of Mongolia. It's, it's really cool to hear those sounds together. All right, let's move to our next country, Korea, both North and South Korea. Um, and we're gonna take a look at the Paansori narrative that style of um, music that's related to poetry. So Korea, there's a lot of um, Chinese and Japanese influence, okay? Korea is sandwiched between both of these countries, between China and between, um, <coughs> excuse me, between China and Japan. And because of the, the squishiness that, or the location, excuse me, of Korea between these two countries, there's a lot of cross influences between them. And as the Chinese empire expanded, it, and as the Japanese empire expanded, especially um, leading up to World War II and throughout World War II, there's lots of influence here. And a major um, uh, a war actually took place in Korea between 1945 and 1952 between those two influences where you have the north of Korea is very heavily influenced and backed by China, which was then faced against the south in Korea, which was heavily influenced and backed by not only the west, um, especially the United States, but also Japan. And so then in 1952, uh, the war ended and it was established that there's going to be two separate countries, um, the Republic of North Korea, the People's Republic of North Korea, as well as South Korea. The site that we're visiting here in Korea as a whole, okay, is, is the type of music, it's called the Pansori narrative. Pause the video here, have a listen to the sixth piece of music. All right, welcome back. So the first impressions that I get in this type of music is that there's this wailing voice, this voice that is sounded throughout the entire piece. There's minimal use of the drum, but there is a type of drum called a puk. A puk, okay, is the type of drum that you see here. Um, it is a very shallow drum with two um, tacked heads, okay. It can be played vertically or horizontally. It's typically played vertically. Okay, and the drummer uses a stick with one hand and his hand on the other side of the drum to create the sound. Okay, this type of music relates very highly to poetry. Okay, 
and the musical identity of Korea itself. Okay, this is one of the only preserved form of music in Korea, and as I talked about in China, those traditions haven't really held fast in terms of the music. There's lots of evolution and influence from the West, and this has happened in Korea as well. It's important because Korean music has struggled to be appreciated around the world, even within Korea itself. Korean people like the evolution and the new style of music that they were um, influenced by, not only from China, but also from Japan. Speaking of Japan, let's head there now. We're going to take a look at two sites, the Kagaku court music and the Kabuki theater style of music. Japan is an island nation as we know. It is exceptionally highly dense in population. There is a lot of people. The traditions are based on the shogun and the samurai, the leaders of not only the culture in Japan, but also the shogun of the the shogun being the, the type of emperor of Japan. The type of religion and the philosophy that most people in Japan or a lot of people in Japan follow is the idea of Zen Buddhism. That this idea of less is best. Minimalism. If you've watched Netflix, there is a lady, her name is Marie Kondo. She is all about minimalism and that idea stems and her, her kind of um, philosophy and the way she lives her life stems from this idea of Zen Buddhism found in China. Or Japan, excuse me, found in Japan. There's lots of consistency and control. Okay, there are, It's very a highly structured society with lots of rules. And those rules come from old, old traditions that have not changed, that have not evolved for centuries. We also get this style of mu music called the Sankyoku, which is a Japanese chamber style of music consisting of a voice, so someone singing, the koto, which is a zither, which you can see here. Remember, a zither is strings that are stretched across a resonating board. We also get the shakuhachi, okay, which is a flute, and we also get the shamisen, which is a lute here. So, the music. We first start out with the uh, Kagaku court style music. This is very, very traditional. Okay, the first impression, so pause the music here, have a listen, or pause the video here, have a listen to this, this song. All right, welcome back. So my first impressions are that we get this suspension in time. Okay, as if we were going back in time into the old feudal system of Japan, we get the suspension where we get the sounds that w w what what it would have sounded like in the old court feudal system of the shogun and the samurai in Japan at that time. The the oral analysis that we get from this is that there's these very long sustained notes, very low rhythmic densities, okay? So a low sounding kind of this drone type rum 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 sounds that are throughout the entire piece itself. And we get these distinctive timbres, these distinctive qualities of sound, colors of sound that we know, okay, these high pitches from the flutes. We get these low rumbles from the percussion. We get the voices. We also get the, the plucked strings. Every piece, every instrument here in the Gagaku Court Music Ensemble is easy, easy to pick out and recognize. Very distinctive timbres. The cultural considerations of this style of music, we get a very elegant style. Confucius, ceremonial music, and a ritualistic movement in this style of music that comes from those old Japanese traditions of the shogun and the samurai. We come to uh, kabuki theater. Very popular music in Japan, okay, developed in the 18th century. We get these twangy lutes and the ho and ho calls shouted out throughout the performance. Um, we get instruments such as the um, nokan, okay, which is the type of bamboo flute. And we get the chobo, which is a section of the kabuki um, performance that is narrated. There's no music that goes along with it. It is narrated. Okay. And there's lots of puppet performances in this um, type of music. It is very classical to Japanese theater, and it is exceptionally popular in Japan even to this day. 
Our last country is Tibet. This is in the southwest corner of Japan, just northeast of um, just northeast of Nepal. We consider Tibet to be the rooftop of the world because Mount Everest lies here. It is, a ve it is at very high elevations and most people live in rural areas. So there's no real major cities in Tibet that people live in. Most people live on the land. And Tibetan Buddhism is practiced by the majority of the people in Tibet. And we get the, um, the living Buddha in the, the form of the Dalai Lama who is the secular and the spiritual leader of the Tibetan Buddhism movement. However, the Dalai Lama was driven out of Tibet by China um, and was uh, forced to exile in India because at the time there was a very large clampdown on Tibetan Buddhism from the Chinese government and that actually drove the Dalai Lama into exile and to... to um, live and in exile in northern India. So we come to our last type of music. Pause the video here, have a listen. All right, this is the Tibetan Buddhist rituals. Okay, we get a lot of these um, foghorn type trumpets, which these, and, and guttural, these very low, boom, real, boom, guttural chants that come with this, these trumpets and these foghorn sounds, these very long, large, low-sounding trumpets. There's overlapping trumpet sounds that happen, and there's a very, very punctuated, very present percussion sound. The instrument that you find in Tibetan Buddhist ritual music, okay, like I said, we get the um, Gya Ling, which is the double reeded aerophones that you see here. We get the trumpets, as well as we get the Rom, which is a pair of very large cymbals that are played um, at the same time. Some cultural considerations to think about. Oh, whoops. Okay, um, the idea of death without dying. Monks will play two tones at the same time, a low tone and a high tone. This is believed to enable a monk's spirit to travel into the spiritual plane, into the spiritual realm, where the monk is able to gain knowledge of the afterlife. They don't actually die, but it's that idea of death without dying, going to the afterlife through meditation without actually dying. The trumpets symbolize, okay, this idea of driving away evil spirits and welcoming good or benevolent spirits. Musical performances are most important rituals involving groups rather than individuals. And we get this idea and the importance of the sound of silence, right? This, this, this Buddhist way of life in terms of silent meditation. The silence and the rests in music are just as important as the notes themselves. That's everything for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at any time. And don't forget to answer this week's discussion question on the music of East Asia. Bye for now.